Я не красиво. Shalom, Professor Dreikos, and welcome, Baruch Abba. I understand this is not your first visit to Israel. Can you tell us what you are doing here right now? Right now, I'm doing something which I have done before. You see, when I first came, I was just teaching. First private classes and in universities. This time I'm working with industry and with the government. And with the welfare department, and with the army, and with urban renewal, all kinds of activities. Can you tell us what you are doing exactly in all these fields? You see, I'm getting into fields where I previously had very little experience. But uh, particularly here, Mr. Omri, who arranged it, found out and thought about it, that my psychological principles could be applied to any area of human relationships. I never would have believed I had anything to say about urban renewal. But as we looked at the literature, he realized that the human element is very often overlooked. Can you tell us in what way you apply all these principles, for example, in urban renewal? You see, urban renewal is an economic problem, a social problem, a technical problem, but it is also and should be a psychological problem, which in the past was often neglected. One didn't really know what to do with the human element. And one did not know how to have the democratic procedure. Everybody was talking about participation in decision-making. But how to do it was relatively little known. I think that is one of my contributions. How to bring the democratic procedure, the ability to solve problems in a democratic way in the various areas. Can you explain to us how you apply democracy in everyday life, in education, in human relations? One can't say they apply a democracy because democracy is here. Democracy is here that people have become equal to each other without even knowing it. So uh, what is necessary is that we need new methods of dealing with human problems and particularly with conflicts. You see, conflicts are inevitable where people live together. And in the past, it was very simple what to do with them. The one who had the power decided the outcome. But today, nobody is willing to give in. And you cannot solve problems in the same way. From the family, through the school, community, industry, government, we need new techniques. You see, uh, most people don't even realize how pathological our whole society is. There probably was never any living soul on this earth who didn't know what to do with its young, except our parents. They have not the slightest idea. They don't know how to get the child up in the morning, how to get him to bed in the evening, particularly with TV around, how to take care of his things, how not to eat too much or too little, how to do his homework, how not to fight with his brothers and sisters. Professor Dreitros, can you tell us some more about your work with parents everywhere, and in particular in Israel? No, the problem is always the same. Parents have to learn new, effective ways. Punishment is no longer effective, and people don't know it. Punishment is only effective in an autocratic society where you beat down on people and they have to behave. So the parents have to learn completely new ways of how to influence children from within, stimulation, in a democratic setting of the family. And whatever we learn in the laboratory of the family can then be applied everywhere else. When the mother learns what to do with the child, then she learns what to do with her husband. And the teacher has to learn the same thing, how to stimulate from within, how to win. One can no longer demand cooperation, one can only win it. One can no longer dictate, one has to lead. And so we work with parents, both in uh, classes, in study groups. I'm very pleased to note that my book on parents is one of the best sellers in this country. And parents apparently find it helpful by reading to how to solve their problems. But reading is not enough. We need also study groups. Parents have to get together and study what to do and what not to do with their children. And here in Israel you, too. Excuse me, is your main work with parents by study groups or do you have other forms of working with parents? Yeah, I just wanted to come to that. We have the guidance centers, which we call family education centers. We need in every community eventually such a center where the parents come and sit in while one family and the children are counseled. 
because they have to learn from each other. Have you, you started in Israel also parents' workshops? We have started in Israel. Uh, but the important thing is that uh, most people don't realize what the difficulties for parents are. Most blame the mother for being immature, maladjusted. They don't realize the fact that all mothers are different. There's not two mothers alike. But all make the same mistakes. And therefore we have to work with them in groups, helping them to see what they are doing and what they could do. And so I'm very happy to say that we have here in Tel Aviv, the beginning, these counseling centers where the parents sit together, usually about 100 people, while one family is counseled. And so they learn from each other. They learn because they all have the same problems. A mother might not find it easy to understand what one explains to her. But when the same thing is explained to another mother, she suddenly begins to understand. So we develop a new technique, a new tradition of raising children. Can you tell us how you applied this same technique in the classroom? Uh, the teachers are confronted with the same situation. The, if the teacher tries to be the boss, to dominate, he will find more and more children in rebellion. And exact, that is actually what's happening. We find more and more children who never learn properly to read and write, who don't want to study. And the teachers then, thinking that they can impose their will and beat the child down with bad marks and punishment, demand more and more. And the less a child wants to study, the more unpleasant we make it for him. But can you make a child study? Unfortunately not. But our teachers would like to know the gimmick. And if they can't make the child study, then they ask the mother to make the child study, which brings only more fight and mother adjustment and hostility in the family. So what is your message to the teachers? Uh, the, education. Yeah, the teachers need uh, two sets of techniques which presently is very little provided to them by the institutions of learning, by the academies. They first have to learn to understand the child, to understand the goals of the child. Teachers are not trained, neither are parents, to understand why a child misbehaves. And you probably know that we developed four goals. We discovered four goals of a misbehaving child where the child either wants to get attention, or show his power, or get even, or wants to be left alone because he thinks he can't do anything. And Can you apply that to all children? To all children, young, all, all young children, up to the age of eight and ten. We are often blamed and accused. How can you put all children's behave, misbehavior in these four goals? And I said, I don't put them there, I found them there. We actually found that young children have a goal. Only the adults and uh, parents and teachers don't know the goals and then fall for it, give in to it. But that is only one part. You ask me about teachers, what yeah. teachers have to learn. Psychodynamics, how to respond to the mistaken motivation, how to create the proper motivation is one thing. But a teacher is also a group leader. Our teachers are trained in the assumption that they have single-handedly to teach and correct 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 children. And they don't know how to do it. The teacher is not working with so and so many individual children. The teacher is only working with one class. May the class be consist of 20, 30, 40, 50. It's one group, you mean? Uh, one group. And the teacher has to learn group dynamics. How to create the atmosphere. How to share the responsibility with the other children. Because she cannot allow, allow, alone anymore impose her will. And that's where the democratic principle comes in again. The teacher has to learn how to be a democratic leader. And we can train teachers because we have worked, particularly I worked it out with the technical school of the Air Force here in Haifa, where I trained the teachers who had no idea about education, how to be autocratic and how to be democratic. And out of this line of characteristic behavior patterns, every teacher can determine his own democratic index, to which extent is democratic. And that is now the main point is, we have to have shared responsibility. And the teacher has to share the responsibility what goes on in the class, as the parents have to share the responsibility with the children. And that can only be done through group discussion. If you know how to discuss it. So the main tool in the class seems to be group discussions. One of them, no, there are many others. There's encouragement and other methods how to win the group pressure, but group discussion is a central part for a democratic education. You know, people talk with children, but how? In most situations, when you talk, you argue. Nobody listens. As soon as somebody says something you don't agree with, 
you argue with them. Now, in this group discussion, the first thing is everybody has to learn to listen, to understand what the other one thinks. The children don't know how the teacher feel, the teacher doesn't know how the children feel. And so they fight with each other. The only way how to get together and to solve the common problems, through understanding each other, helping each other, is through a typical form of group discussion. If you discuss uh, something which is not relevant, uh, some subject matters and so on, if you uh, use a, uh, cl the discussion to preach, to impose your will, then it won't go. The teachers have to learn, and the parents have to learn, how to be group leaders. Professor Dreyfus, can I ask you about the term that I found in most of your books, particularly in the one about equality that was recently translated into Hebrew, this term of competition? Now, equality and competition belong together. And that probably is one of the greatest tragedies of our time. We have become equal, not all over the world, but primarily in the United States after the last war and in Israel after the war of independence. This equality expresses itself that nobody is willing to submit, to give in. And so we have become equal without knowing what it is and without knowing how to live with each other as equals. Uh, for instance, as long as the father was a boss, there was no problem. The women had to do what he wanted them. There was no sexual problem. Women was, had to be satisfied with how much or little the husband wanted. There was no economic, no in-law problems. But when they became equal, then they needed new methods of getting along, and they don't know it, and so they fight. Each one afraid that he doesn't get enough and has to give too much. And so the idea of equality is still the basic idea of democracy, the most difficult to comprehend, because people don't know how, what, can, what can it be? Because people are different. But equality doesn't mean that all are the same. Equality means that everybody has the same status and can't be manipulated, can't be imposed upon, is participating in decision making. Or maybe now, he's valuable in the same way? He is, is as a mean? fundamental person. You see, it is the same in an orchestra. You have the first violin, the second violin, you have three uh, sets of uh, flutes, and the third flutist or the drum, or anyone who plays on the occasional, is as important for the whole as anyone else, and has to be respected for that. But when it comes to competition, then is where the trouble lies. Uh, see, competition was necessary as a transition from an autocratic society, where you couldn't move up and down. You were born on a certain level and had to stay there. So each one then tried to be more and higher. And so under this competitive strife, great technical and scientific process has been achieved, but at the expense of the human being. What happens to an individual who fell on the wayside, nobody bothered. Now then, we become more, uh, more concerned with the function and fulfillment of the individual. We realize that competition is the worst thing which can happen. It pitches one against the other one. In the Dibos, family. You want to say that the major motivation is not to compete or to succeed, but rather to contribute. No, the main motivation is to belong. You see, human beings are social beings. They want to belong. And if you feel as unequal, inferior, you doubt that you belong. And then you're only concerned with your self-elevation. So the basic desire is to belong. And as long as you are not discouraged, then you contribute. As long as you feel belonging, as we call it a Gemeinschaftsgefühl, this feeling of belonging, as long as you have that, your way of finding a place is through contributing. But when you are discouraged, and we discourage each other, we discourage our children almost systematically from beginning, then of course this feeling of belonging is no longer through useful contribution, but through power, through superiority, through all kinds of uh, means which are not in the interest of all, but only in the selfish interest. Professor, speaking about competition and discouragement, I can recall that I heard once a nice story that you had about it. Would you like to tell us? Yeah, you mean story the story? About, uh, Mary the Preacher. Mary the Preacher, which shows uh, how wrong we are when we strive for superiority, for perfection, for our own glory. There was this woman called Mary, who was a wonderful preacher. And she spoke with the tongue of angels. And the people came from all over the world to listen to her. And one day a friend asked her, Mary, how did you become such a wonderful preacher? And she thought for a moment and said, frankly, I don't know. I only remember when I started out preaching, the devil come each time to visit me. 
One time he came and gave me a pat on the shoulder and said, Mary's sermon was wonderful. The next time she gave, he gave me a kick and said, Mary's sermon was lousy. And each time I had to chase the devil away. And since he no longer comes to visit me, I think I'm doing all right. <laughs> you see, she recognized this devil of vanity, this golden calf of personal success, which we all worship and don't know what we do to each other. How we become enemies to each other, how the brothers fight with brothers. You see, people don't realize how abnormal the situation is. The idea of brotherly love at one time meant the greatest devotion. Today, you wouldn't wish to your worst enemies to be treated like brothers treat brothers. <laughs> the competitive strife between brothers and sisters, between parents and children, between everybody. It is ruining our human relationships. Professor Dreyfus, I understand that originally you are a pupil of Adler. Yeah. But in a way, you interpreted Adler's theory. Can you tell us what was your main contribution to Adlerian psychology? It is probably hard to believe that theoretically about what we call the model of man, I have very little to add or subtract from Adler. His last concept, he had several concept periods, in the last period he recognized man as a decision-making being in his freedom to choose, in the need of social development, social participation, Gemeinschaftsgefühl. He discovered the idea of a logic of social living, which means equality, because where there is no equality, there is only up, up and down fight with no harmony. Now, my contribution was perhaps less in adding to the theory, but applying it. I'm a pragmatist. I'm only interested in Adlerian psychology as a theory, as far as it permits a certain action. For instance, as it permits us the holistic approach that we see the whole person immediately. And that we believe in the free choice, which gives us the optimism that everybody can change. So my contribution, as I see it, is to make Adlerian psychology teachable. Make it practical. I can see that, but could you like to tell us of all fields that you are in, I mean, starting with psychiatry, then education, then human relations, perhaps now urban renewal, labor relationships, what is the main message that you carry on? Believe it or not, I think I really try, that might sound horrible, but in my little way I might contribute to change society, to change the whole pattern in which we are living. Because I find so much missing in social psychi in, so in uh, sociology and social behavioral sciences. They don't know, most people don't know that we are entering a new culture, that what we experience today are the birth pain of a new democratic culture. Everybody speaks about the rapid changes, but I blame many factors on the changes without realizing it is a development of democracy. And our difficulty is the freedom which we have reached in our inability to cope with it, to use the freedom. So I really feel that we have a universal task to open the eyes of people, not only to what can be done, but to their own ability to do it, to recognize that we have to become really social, that we have to substitute cooperation for competition. Professor Dreykos, as our time is short, I would like to conclude first of all by thanking you and then by hoping that for the sake of all of us and for society we'll find a way to apply all those ideas and to live better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.